doesn't it seem like all embedded designs are some kind of balancing act? And this is especially true when it comes to power consumption and resource allocation. Sure, you want analog in your design or the newest and coolest sensors, but do you have the power budget for all of that and keep it within a reasonable amount of board space? Uh, yes, the balancing act of today's embedded designs can be tricky. But I'm here to tell you, my friends, that you can lower your power consumption, have real analog, and keep your board real estate in check. With the help of microchips, PIC, and AVR microcontrollers. How exactly? Let's get into it. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Mark McComb from Microchip and I explore how microchips pick and AVR MCUs are a game changer when it comes to low power embedded designs. We investigate the benefits that the flexible signal routing core independent peripherals and analog peripheral manager can bring to modern embedded designs and how these microcontroller families can help you avoid a variety of pitfalls in your next design. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Microchip. Hi, Mark. Thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure. Okay, so we're talking about enabling low power applications with PIC and AVR microcontrollers today. But before we get started, what all will we be covering? The first thing I'm going to talk about is core capabilities. So this is going to include things like clock options and low power modes. The second thing I'm going to talk about is peripheral capabilities. And as you'll see, we actually focus a lot on integrating more into the hardware. And this is going to enable things like core independence. So we'll talk about that. And what that actually means brings to low power applications. And we'll also talk about analog peripherals. We integrate a lot of analog into these devices and there's some real low power benefits that come with that. There's some additional features where we can enable things and disable things on the fly, which also helps. I'll also show a couple of examples just to kind of reinforce some of the concepts we're talking about. And then we'll have some resources. Excellent. Okay, so when it comes to embedded applications, what kind of benefits, including low power, do the PIC and AVR MCUs bring to the table? Yeah, so as we'll see, we integrate a lot of capabilities onto these devices so that we can handle tasks more and more in hardware. And what that means is that when we're in hardware handling tasks, a lot of times we can do that in lower power modes. We can do that with lower power oscillators, for example, and, and other capabilities that will help us really mitigate that power consumption. The other aspect of this is that these devices actually have a very large operating range. So we can operate anywhere from 1.8 up to 5.5 volts. So depending on how robust you need this application to be, so for example, if you're in an industrial setting, you may want to run this at 5 volts. If you want to be a little more optimal for power consumption. You can run these all the way down to 1.8. And of course, what we supply to the chip itself, voltage-wise, is really going to dictate how much power we consume. There's some other aspects of this that make these products very viable in today's applications. So again, as always, PIC and AVR microcontrollers are very small. They're low cost. I'll talk about in the next slide, we do have a lot of pin flexibility to help minimize layout complexity and things like that. But we also have the ability to interconnect with other microchip technologies. And we'll talk a little bit about that when we talk about communication peripherals. But just to kind of explain a little bit more what I mean when I say flexibility, pin flexibility. Well, these devices are small, they're very low pin count, and they come loaded with a lot of features. Features normally want to use a pin on the device. So if you have a lot of features and very few pins, that can be a problem, but we've integrated some facilities that allow you to actually dynamically move signals around the pins or even share signals on one pin. So if you want to have 
two different peripherals interfacing with a pin, you can do that. There's capabilities in place. And the whole goal with all of this is to keep everything as small as possible, as low power as possible, and really help focus on integrating the product into an existing design or into a new design while keeping that application real estate very small. Okay, so Mark, what do our clock options look like for the AVR and PIC MCUs? Yeah, so PIC and AVR MCUs have the ability to interconnect with a lot of external clocks, for example. So if you wanted to use an external clock oscillator or a crystal or a ceramic resonator, you can do that. The other nice thing is that these devices also come with a full complement of internal clocks. And these internal clocks are optimized to be as low power as possible. Having these clocks inside of the device or even external to the device and having a CPU present means that we can actually dynamically switch between these clocks whenever we need a higher level of resolution and maybe that's when we consume the most power. But then when we're done that particular part or task in the application that doesn't require that resolution anymore, we can then switch into a lower power state using a lower power clock. The other nice thing here is that we have a feature on these devices called the automatic clock tuning, which allows you to use an internal clock that may not have the tolerance that you would get with an external clock. But what you can do is you can actually put, say, something like a can clock crystal connected to the MCU and use that as a reference. And then what's going to happen is that specialized clock tuning hardware on the microcontroller is going to regularly compare that internal clock frequency with the external low power clock frequency and then adjust that internal clock as needed to make sure it's staying time within timing constraints for the application. So essentially, this is going to allow for us to use a higher resolution timing, but still keep things as low power as possible. So you mentioned low power modes earlier. What does that look like for these MCUs? Yeah, so these devices, the PIC and AVRs, come with a full complement of low-power modes. So what this allows you to do is to run the central processing unit and the peripherals who have separate clocks at different frequencies. So if you can reduce how much is running, you're actually going to reduce the amount of current you're consuming. And you have the capability to either run these things full speed or shut them completely off in every option in between and what this allows you to do is kind of balance power consumption with system responsiveness. And you can do this again on the fly. So at runtime, if I need this device to be in one operating mode where I'm consuming more power, and then once a particular application is completed or a task is handled, I can go into a lower power mode. The other nice thing with this is that because we're integrating more peripherals onto these devices, a lot of these can actually operate in these lower power modes. So that means that you can stay in a lower power state for a longer period of time. And most low power applications, you're going to want to have components within the system stay in a lower power state for as long as possible. And this really helps get to that. So you also mentioned core independent peripherals. So can you talk about that a bit as well? And how do they tie into this low power aspect? Yeah. So, you know, first of all, core independent peripherals are the same as any other peripheral. And the goal with any peripheral is to reduce the amount of code you have to write, reduce the amount of work that the central processing unit has to do and kind of offload that to hardware. And there's some advantages there. Now, when I say core independent peripherals, what I'm saying is PIC and AVR devices really focus on integrating more and focus more on offloading the central processing unit from common tasks and offloading that to the hardware. And this comes with advantages. So first of all, task can be handled without core intervention. So this means that the peripheral can handle something while the CPU is either a doing something else, or maybe it's in a lower power mode. If it's doing something else, that has kind of one of the lower power implications that we talked about in the previous slide, where we want to stay in a lower power state for as long as possible, in as low power state as possible. And if we're handling things in these higher power states, then we want to do that quickly and get back to that lower power mode. So if the central processing unit is handling one aspect of the application, so its own tasks, and the peripherals 
are handling other tasks within the system, well, you're handling tasks in parallel, and this allows you to get back into that lower power state as much as possible. Again, because we have this integration of the peripherals, this allows us to use things like lower power oscillators, be in lower power modes whenever we handle tasks and so on. Okay, so Mark, can we go through each of these peripheral categories in a bit more depth? Absolutely. So just to start with, we have kind of bucketized peripheral groupings, just to make it a little easier to understand what a particular peripheral does, because there's going to be peripherals that you've never heard of before. So what we've done is we've bucketized them or categorized them into the categories you see on the left-hand side of the slide. So we have things like integrated analog, waveform control. We have peripherals that handle things like timing and measurement, peripherals that allow us to accomplish safety and monitoring, other peripherals that are going to be focusing on communication, peripherals that handle user interface, and then another category called system flexibility. Excellent. Okay. Can we start at the top? Let's talk about waveform control. So waveform control peripherals are basically peripherals that, well, control waveforms, right? So if we have something like a PWM drive, we have the ability to generate, first of all, generate the PWM. And we have a variety of modules that have different resolutions from 10 to 16 bit. But we also have the ability to control that PWM to some extent. So if we want to do complementary outputs or if we want to interface with things like H bridges or half bridges, or if we want to do things where we're mixing PWMs with other signals on the device, we can do that. A recent peripheral is the waveform extender that you see here, and that's a recent addition to the AVR family. And what this does is it helps you generate very motor control centric waveforms based on whatever PWM you're using, whether it's on chip or off chip, but it helps control that. So things like dead band delay and so on. Other peripheral category is the timing and measurement. Every microcontroller is going to have a timer of some sort on it. And these are peripherals that kind of expand on that. So we do have the usual complement of 8, 16, and even 32-bit timing capabilities on there. We can get to 32-bit, in fact, using a new timer called the universal timer, which allows you to daisy-chain timers, and you can get extremely long delays or timing periods. The other thing with this is that we want to be able to evaluate timing-based signals. So, for example, if we have a PWM coming in or a clock signal coming in or just some periodic event, we have the ability to, in hardware, determine a the period of the signal, if it's a repeating signal, and we can measure that independent of the CPU. We can also measure things like duty cycle. We can measure or compare input signal to a value that we have on the device and so on. If we move into peripherals covered by the safety and monitoring, these are peripherals that are going to allow us to get to certain safety standards. So if you're designing something that needs to be class B, for example, these peripherals are going to help you to get there by handling certain tasks that are important in those kind of applications. So if you need to check things like memory, if you want to know how robust your memory is, we have things like the CRC or the cyclic redundancy check. Or if you need to check things like your software integrity. We have things like window watchdog timers and a lot more peripherals to help out with that. Communication peripherals, we have the usual complement. We have things like the I2C on AVRs that's going to be called the two-wire interface or TWI. We have the SPI or SPI interface, UART, and along with the UART comes protocol support for things like LIN, or if you're looking at lighting protocols, we have DMX and DALI. We also have the ability to take certain products and interface them with automotive CAN bus or CAN FD. We also have newer peripherals that actually interface with the new I3C or the improved inter-integrated circuit. And these products have just recently come out. So let's talk about the I3C a bit more. Sure. So basically what I3C is, it's, it's called improved integrated circuit. Basically what it does is it offers a new specification with improvements over the traditional I2C interface for sensor devices and system management. And you're going to have higher speeds, you're going to have more error detection and recovery, and you're going to be able to interface with traditional networks. But 
big thing that this brings to the table, especially when we're talking about low power, is the operating voltage range. And as you can see here, these devices can actually operate between 3.63 volts on the high end and all the way down to 0.95 volts, which is going to really help with power consumption. So user interface was another core independent peripheral category as well, right? Yes. And when we talk about user interface, we're talking about things like LCD interfaces, so hardware on devices to facilitate with that. But we're also talking about our touch technologies. And when I say touch technologies, I'm talking about capacitive touch technologies. If you look at the PIC devices, they're going to implement something called M-Touch and if you look at the AVRs, we're going to have the PTC. And the basic difference between those two is one is more open with the software, so you can go in and actually make tweaks and changes, but it's it's a little more complex. The other one is is very much a lot of that is hidden away from the customer, and that just makes it maybe a little more higher level and easier to implement. But again, as you increase flexibility with something, it does increase complexity. Yeah, and just to kind of round things up, let's talk about the system flexibility peripherals. And these peripherals are what are going to allow you to do things like interconnect with other functionality on the chip. So, for example, the event system, what that allows you to do is take different peripherals on the AVR devices and kind of route them anywhere you want on the system the custom logic, which we'll talk about a little bit more, gives you that capability on PIC devices, but we also have custom logic on AVR devices. Direct memory access lets you move information around the chip without the core being involved. When I talked earlier about that system flexibility with being able to run multiple signals to a chip, what I was talking about was the peripheral pin selector PPS here. And that's an incredible peripheral that, again, it allows you at runtime to take those signals and dynamically switch between them. Or if you need to, you can set them up when you first power up the microcontroller and then lock them so that they don't change inadvertently. All right, that makes sense. Now, what about the logic for the PIC and the AVR devices? What does that look like? Yeah, so if you look at the devices, we actually have two variations of this. So first of all, on the PIC devices, you're going to see something called the Configurable Logic Cell, or CLC for short. On the AVR devices, you're going to have Configurable Custom Logic, or CCL for short. And these are kind of similar, but sort of different at the same time. So with the uh, Configurable Logic Cell on the PIC, you're kind of presented with logic in the form of gates and sequential logic, and you can interconnect them in different ways and very useful if you want to route signals. I mean, you can run almost any signal into this. So you can see there on the left, we have analog digital peripheral signals. We have internal clocks. We have IO pins, even register bits to some extent. Similarly, we can do the same on the AVR devices where we're running signals through this configurable custom logic. However, the interface with it is a little bit different. So instead of using just gates and combinational and sequential logic, you're actually dealing with the custom logic using truth tables. So it just depends on what the customer is most comfortable with using and what best suits the design. But again, you have that ability to apply logic and make decisions on various combinations of signals and then leave the CPU or, or, or mitigate as much as possible the amount of CPU intervention you actually need with something. Okay, so Mark, can you give us an example on how custom logic can help benefit low power applications? Yeah, so as I mentioned a couple of times, we want to keep these devices in the lowest power state for as long as possible. And so if you uh, look at the screen, what I have here is kind of an example called combinational wake up from sleep. And what this does is we have three SIGs coming into the device. The first one is an analog signal, which is fed in and dealing with being read by the comparator. We're using some on-chip reference to compare that input signal against. And when that signal passes a certain threshold, we want it to wake up the device. We also have a push button. When that push button isn't pressed or is pressed, we want it to wake up the device. We also have maybe a digital signal coming in that I'm showing here with that little pulse. And when that pulse goes high or that pulse goes low, we want it to wake the device. Now the device here, the leaf is representing the device being in a low power state, sleep mode, 
perhaps, which is the lowest possible power state on a PIC device. What I have here is a configurable logic cell. Now, the configurable logic cell is configured so that it is going to make a decision when to wake up the device. So traditionally, what we would have to do is if we wanted to check for three separate conditions to see if we needed to do something like execute some code, we would usually have all three of these configured in a state where it would wake up the device. And then if one of those conditions was true, the device would wake up, the central processing unit would go and check to see if the, the other two conditions were true. And if it was, it would ex execute some code. The problem is, if it wasn't, it would just go back to sleep and it would have spent some valuable power actually checking to see if the other conditions were true. In this instance here, though, we're using configurable logic while the device is in a lower power state. Because this configurable logic cell can operate in the sleep mode or a lower power state, what we can do is actually feed these signals into the configurable logic cell, and the configurable logic cell will make a decision. And if the comparator output or the push button is a true statement as what our requirement is to wake up, and the digital input is true according to what we want our wake-up condition to be, then and only then will the device wake up. And we didn't have to check all these conditions. So that is going to save us a considerable amount of power. So can we talk a bit more about the analog component here as well? These MCUs have on-chip analog, right? Absolutely. And just to note that this is real analog from the ground up. This isn't gates or digital logic made to behave like analog. This is true analog. Now, one of the reasons we can get a lot of analog onto these devices. And if you look at this slide, we do have a lot of analog on there. We have things like op amps and analog to digital converters, D to A's. We have multi-voltage IO, high current IO, zero cross detection, and so on. The reason we can get all of that analog onto these devices is because we are naturally a small architecture. So if you look at a PIC or an AVR architecture, they're naturally small. And if you want to get an application or a product into a small package, other devices are going to need to do process shrinks. And when you do a process shrink, the more you do a process shrink, you get some undesirable effects. So you get crosstalk and you get capacitance. And in some instances, this really makes it hard to put analog on. But because the PIC and AVR cores are actually naturally small, more of the die can be used in larger process technologies. We can get more analog on it. So that's a true advantage. Now, the nice thing, with this and as it relates to low power is that these peripherals are integrated onto a microcontroller that has a central processing unit and what this means is we can reconfigure these peripherals at runtime so if i decide that my comparator needs to change or if i need to change my reference into an op amp or if i need to maybe change a calculation mode on an analog to digital converter i can do that with the central processing unit. If I were using off-chip analog, like an op-amp with a resistor ladder on the output, it would make that, to change the gain on that or to change those resistor values is gonna be very hard to do without some extra complexity in the circuit. The nice thing with this too is that we can actually interconnect these peripherals with digital peripherals on the device. So if I wanted to interconnect them with clock sources or things like logic that we talked about in the previous section, I can do that as well. The nice thing here, too, is that we have the ability to minimize the need to design for worst-case scenarios. So if you expect that a certain condition is going to occur within the system, traditionally with external analog, what we'd have to do is, because it's fixed, we can't change it, we need to design for that worst-case scenario, and this application runs in that format for the length of its runtime. And that may not be the most power-optimized way to run things. In this instance, because we have the analog integrated onto the device, what this means is in that some conditions or some scenarios, we can take advantage of this capability and other parts of the system can recognize when these worst case scenarios occur. The CPU can then go in, make changes to the analog to accommodate that worst case scenario and deal with it or live through it. And then whenever that worst case scenario goes away, we can reconfigure this analog back into a lower power state. Just to kind of talk a little bit more about this and what integrated analog is, 
and relate it to core independence, I want to talk a little bit about the analog to digital converters with computation. Now, this is kind of the flagship integrated analog with core independent capability on it. And if you take a look at the slide we have here, basically what I have is a, an analog to digital converter with a series of inputs. And we have the ability to trigger that analog to digital converter, either using things like timers or PWMs or integrated logic, other analog, maybe an external source. Again, the whole goal here is to offload the central processing unit. We can either read an external analog source, or because we have internal analog, we can actually read that analog on the analog to digital converter internal to the device. And we can trigger that read either using the peripherals or an external source of some kind and actually keep the central processing unit from having to actually accomplish this itself in software. Oftentimes, you can do this in lower power modes too. And what that does is not only does it keep you in that lower power state, but because you have clocks off in the system, it actually makes it a little less noise on the analog input signal. And just to take a look a little bit more at the reason we call this analog to digital converters with computation, again, the whole point of core independent peripherals is to offload the central processing unit. So what they've done is they've taken functions and capabilities that you'd normally have to write software for in these software routines, such as oversampling or averaging, low-pass filtering, things like accumulation, things that we used to have to write software for, instead are now integrated onto the microcontroller. In fact, if uh, you think back to the capacitive touch sensing or the user interface peripherals we talked about earlier, the PIC devices actually implement the M-Touch capability inside of the analog to digital converter. So these things are very computationally oriented peripherals. They're not just your standard analog to digital converters. Okay, so can we also take a closer look at the functionality of these analog peripherals with integrated intelligence? Absolutely. So if you look at the slide here, basically what I have is a couple of analog signals coming into the device, and I have the microcontroller in a lower power mode. Again, these peripherals can operate in many instances in a lower power state. So in this instance, the central processing unit is a lower power mode, but we are still evaluating the input signal. At the top, it's going through a couple of op amps. And again, we can daisy chain a lot of these and interconnect them. So I have an op amp behaving as a input buffer, which is handy in, in signals that require a high impedance input into the microcontroller. We also have that output going into a second op amp, which is serving as an amplifier. And then that output is fed internally into the analog to digital converter. And what can happen there is that we have a trigger source maybe on another pin where we have that analog signal coming in through a comparator and we're using the on-chip reference fed into a digital to analog converter, which is further subdividing that reference to something very much refined for the input signal. We're feeding that into some logic and we have a timer that's operating one of these lower power modes and that's going to trigger the analog to digital converter to make a calculation on that input signal. Whenever that calculation is completed, now remember whether that's an averaging, so maybe I'm taking 64 samples and then averaging that out. When I hit a certain value and that's completed, I can trigger an interrupt and then wake up the microcontroller. The microcontroller, because we have a CPU on this, we can actually go in and make changes to these peripherals. In fact, if you take a look at this slide here, the central processing unit is actually being fed into the op amp. And what this allows us to do is actually change that gain stage. Now, if you look at the slide, you'll see that I have that resistor ladder and integrated. Well, it is. There's certain values of gain that I can make changes to on the fly and change that as application demands dictate. So, Mark, in the beginning, you mentioned that there was a way to enable and disable the peripherals as well. So what does that disable function look like? Right. So most of the peripherals, you can go in and disable or enable on the fly dynamically at runtime. And this usually just means you just toggle a bit associated with the peripheral. However, we do have an extra feature on uh, more recent PIC devices called the peripheral module disable. And you may be asking, like, what's the difference between this and simply disabling the peripheral? Well, if you disable a peripheral, 
many times you're keeping certain internal connections and gates active. And what this does is it leads to the draw of electrical current. And of course, that's associated power consumption, right? What the peripheral module disable, or PMD for short, does is it actually ensures a complete shutdown of that peripheral by disconnecting things like registers and internal connections. And this results in the absolute lowest power consumption for uh, the selected peripheral. All right. So I'm also curious about the analog peripheral manager you mentioned. What kind of benefits are we looking at here? Right. So, you know, this is a recent peripheral that is on our more recent PIC devices. And again, because we've integrated a lot of this analog onto the device, analog peripherals can draw a lot of current. Analog can draw a lot of current. So if we have a peripheral similar to the peripheral module disable, for analog, that would be quite handy. But the difference between the analog peripheral manager and the peripheral module disable is that it actually implements clocks. And the clock has start and end events. In fact, it has two start and end events. So what this means is, is that you could only enable certain peripherals, and you can categorize these, and that's why there's two start events. You can group them, and you can start a series of these analog peripherals at a certain point. That'll enable the peripheral, and then we can turn that grouping of peripherals off whenever we don't need them anymore. So essentially what we're doing is we're only using the analog when we need it, and we're only consuming power by the analog when we need that analog in the system. That makes sense. Now, can we take a closer look at an example of this analog peripheral manager in action? Sure. Let's take a look at this example here. This is just a basic temperature measurement example. And what I have here is on the left-hand side of the slide is a resistance temperature detector, or an RTD for short, connected to the pins of a microcontroller and is part of a voltage divider. And if you look over onto the microcontroller, you can see that I'm using the integrated analog. So I have my analog to digital converter, which is going to read the input of that pin, the second pin down, and it's going to determine what that temperature is based off of that RTD sensor. Now, what's going to happen is we're going to time this so that it only occurs every minute that we're going to go out, we're going to read that temperature, and then we're going to have a predetermined value that the user has programmed in the analog to digital converter, which is going to be kind of a, a threshold. So if that threshold value gets passed, then and only then will it interrupt and then wake up the microcontroller, which is currently in a low power state, and then the microcontroller or the central processing unit, to be more specific, is going to take that value. But again, if that threshold value isn't surpassed or isn't passed, then this device stays in its low power state. If you look down, we also have that op amp as part of the application. And the op amp is actually going to be used just to create a constant bias current across the temperature sensor. And we're using internal reference voltages in order to serve as a reference on that positive input of, of the op amp. So let's kind of step through this and see how the analog peripheral manager actually handles this application. So initially, we have the device is asleep. It's in a lower power mode. All of our analog peripherals are shut off or disabled, so they're not consuming current. Every minute, what's going to happen is the analog peripheral manager is going to turn on the fixed voltage reference. It's going to turn on the DAC. It's going to turn on the op amp. And it's going to turn on the analog section of the analog to digital converter. And what we're doing here is we're giving capacitance associated with the analog to digital converter a chance to settle. Okay, so after a few microseconds, once that capacitance has had a chance to settle, the analog peripheral manager, because we've got the logic aspect of the analog to digital converter in a separate group, is going to fire the logic up. The logic is then going to evaluate that input signal on that second pin to determine what the RTD value is and determine if that has actually surpassed a value or our threshold value. If it does, then and only then it will wake up the central processing unit and we can do some processing with it. So we can log it, we can notify over a bus, we can do whatever we want. Now, if you take a look at this 
representation, this waveform chart here, or this diagram. On the top, you can see this is kind of what our current consumption would look like without the analog peripheral manager. So there's two ways to deal with this. Either we would need to have the central processing unit awake so that it can go in and enable that analog. And so we're running that central processing unit clock, we're running code, or what we can do is just leave those peripherals on at all times and not shut them off at all. So if we look down below that, you can see what the result is with the analog peripheral manager. You can see that every minute we're firing up the op amp, the DAC, and the FVR, or the fixed voltage reference, and then after a certain period of time to allow that capacitance to settle, then we're firing up the logic on the analog to digital converter. After we're done, everything gets shut back off, and then we just wait another minute until we actually fire things up again. Okay, so Mark, what kind of supporting assets do you guys have for these MCUs? Yeah, so on this slide, I kind of broke it up into three parts. So locate resources, develop application, test and deploy. So locate resources, what I'm showing here is the MP Lab Discover tool. And if you go to microchip.com forward slash discover, this is a great way to find all sorts of resources depending on the application you're trying to create. So if you're looking for some reference material in the form of application notes, code examples, it'll even show you videos related. So if you're looking to do something with the Analog Peripheral Manager and you go to Discover and you just type in Analog Peripheral Manager, it'll pull up all sorts of resources that'll help you get up and running. The next aspect of this is going to be, okay, I've got an example. I want to open this example and start doing some development or, or program it onto a, a piece of hardware. Well, I'm going to use the preferred method here, which is the MPLABX IDE, which is our tool chain that allows us to actually program and develop code for any of Microchip's programmable devices, including our PIC and AVR devices. Included with that, you're going to get the ability to debug and simulate. You're going to have interface in order to program the microcontroller from within the IDE. You're also going to have a variety of software languages that you can program with, whether it's assembly or C. In this instance, it's C. We have the MPLAB XC compiler, and we have an XC compiler for any of our architectures, 8, 16, or 32-bit. We also have a plugin shown on here called the MPLAB Code Configurator. Now, we've integrated a lot of hardware onto these products. And at first, this can look kind of intimidating. I mean, anytime you offload software and create tasks or create mechanisms on the device that can handle tasks and hardware, the, the hardware gets a little complicated or a little more complex. So what this does, the MPLAB Code Configurator, is it actually presents features or peripherals on the microcontroller in a very easy view. It's a graphical view that allows you to actually use drop-down menus, radio buttons, sliders. There's even like feedback mechanisms. So depending on how you set things up, it'll tell you things like if I were to set up my clock on the device, it tells you exactly based on your settings, the clock divider you use, the clock source, what your system clock is going to be. And it just makes it a lot easier to develop these applications from scratch or to open up one of these examples and see how that's from Discover and see how it's being implemented. Next, we have the ability to program a device. And of course, we have a series of development boards, including these boards shown on the right and the little gumstick size boards that you see there. They're called Curiosity Nano Boards. And any product that we put out is going to have an associated Curiosity Nano. And the idea with the Curiosity Nano Board is that it's going to integrate a programmer debugger on it. And it's also going to have the ability to interface with most of the pins on that device. And then we have a daughter board that we can plug an expansion board. And then we can take advantage of things like microelectronica clicks. If we want to do a little bit of bench testing at our desk, it's pretty easy. You just plug the click board in, the C Nano into this baseboard, and then you can do some evaluation. Excellent. Mark, where do these new peripherals land in the overall PIC and AVR families? Yeah, so what I have up on the slide here is just some of our more recent devices. Over on the far left, we have the AVR EA family, and this is a device that's going to integrate a 12-bit differential analog to digital converter with computation, all the way up to a recent device for our PIC family called the PIC18 uh, Q71 family. The one that I showed today was the PIC18 F56 Q71 family. And at the bottom of the screen, you can see 
kind of the nomenclature that we use with these devices. And this particular product is going to feature not only the analog to digital converter with computation, but it's a differential analog to digital converter as most of them are on the screen here. But we are also going to have that computation capability and context switching. And what context switching allows you to do is actually, if you want to have one pin do one form of computation, so say burst averaging, and then you want another pin to do something else, maybe low pass filtering, you can actually automate that in hardware so the central processing unit doesn't have to reconfigure the analog to digital converter. It just automatically does it when that pin select. Some other things, you can see that on uh, the PIC 16 F171 and the PIC 18 Q71 products, we have op amps. In fact, the Q71 has two. If you take a look at the AVRDD family, we have this thing called the multi-voltage I.O. And the multi-voltage I.O., what this allows you to do is actually just interface with multiple voltage domains. In the past, we would have had to have an extra chip to do some level conversion if we wanted to, say, have some sensors working in a 1.8 voltage domain and still have the microcontroller running at that 5.5 volt domain. Or if we wanted to communicate with another device, like, say, one of microchip SAM devices and, and send information over a 3.3 volt domain. Now we can do that without any kind of level shifters. So these are just some of the, the more recent products, and I encourage you to explore these. There's a lot of integration in there. The modern PIC and AVR microcontroller family is quite amazing. Excellent. Well, Mark, before we go, can you recap your main points for me? Absolutely. So the key takeaway here is that we're focusing on integration. We're focusing on hardware integration, feature integration. We're looking at integrating analog onto these devices. And the whole goal here is not only to reduce the size of the application, but primarily to kind of make things lower power by offloading the central processing unit, allowing tasks to be handled simultaneously so that we're handling some tasks in hardware, some tasks with the CPU, and get ourselves back into these lower power modes as quickly as possible to really reduce that power consumption. The analog on these devices, real analog. These devices, because of their process technology, they can integrate a lot of analog and a lot of capabilities associated with that. Because this is an intelligent device with a central processing unit, we can dynamically change how these things operate at runtime. And again, because we have all of these features, it can be a little overwhelming to the newer user or even to the user of legacy devices who want to try out these new features. Well, We've put tools in place to kind of mitigate that confusion and things like our MCC Melody code plugin or code configurator plugin, which is going to allow us to present the peripherals and these features in a higher level, like in a graphical view and allow you to reconfigure things inside of this graphical element. And then what you do is you click a button, it generates the code. And this code, a lot of the times is production ready. You don't have to touch it and you're off to the races. Excellent. Well, Mark, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Microchip. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash EE.